What's the strategy to, uh, to take out of the room this afternoon? The strategy is to choose one or two of the things that I've talked about and commit to it. Um, Oprah Winfrey, who's a fairly busy individual, um, manages to run five kilometres every day before she does anything. Now, if that woman... How long does that take? I'm not a runner. Well, probably a while Can for I do Oprah, it I'm thinking. Um, but, but the fact is, she was asked in an interview recently, well, how do you do that? And she looked at the interview and she said, I just recommit to it every day. And I think that's exactly what we have to do. We have to decide. You know, that's uh, something that's really important to us. Mm -hmm. it's, it's ironic, isn't it, that uh, with everything that we have in life now, you, you know, that you're talking about the Dalai Lama, I actually have that little uh, fridge magnet at home, the purpose of our lives is to be happy. And in so many ways, uh, you know, our parents' generation say that, you know, life has gotten so much easier, and yet we are less happy than ever before. We are, in fact, if you look at the happiness index, which uh, Marty Seligman does right around the world, um, Australia's actually not doing that great. I mean, we're not as bad as the Soviet Union, but, um, we, which is good to know. Um, but the happiest people in the world, uh, funnily enough, come from Scandinavia, and maybe it's all that blonde hair and ABBA, I'm not sure, but uh, maybe we've got some lessons to learn from but them. But why are we so unhappy? Um... Look, I think it's because... Um, I, the, one is I don't think we, we're prioritising. Two, I don't think we're actually looking after ourselves well enough. I think if you look at the 30-year-olds, you're about 30, um, I actually think that they're, they're punishing themselves. I think they party so hard um, and they don't prioritise correctly. If you think about what the ingredients are for a really, truly happy life, um, sure, having fun's part of it, but we know that there are two other parts, and that's engagement uh, and having meaning in, in our lives. And I think that a lot of people are, head up, uh, are stuck on that first part, which is the hedonistic part, the pleasure thinking, uh, pleasure seeking. Mm -hmm. And the analogy I often use is when you um, bite into a piece of chocolate for the very first time, do you like Toblerone? chocolate, you know, the Swiss mm -hmm, mm -hmm. chocolate, the first bite you have is absolutely delicious. The second bite's not as good. We habituate to that type of pleasure, but you never habituate to the engagement or the meaning. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you uh, a little bit about uh, parenting, um, not least because I have two primary school age children. Well, in fact, one of them is um, some mornings when he wakes up, he's, uh, he's a little boy, and some mornings he's a teenager, and you're never quite sure what you're going to get. Mm. But... It feels as if parenting has become a whole lot harder. Uh, I, would you agree that it has, or, or is it just perhaps that you know, the noise of the other spheres of our lives has, has become, uh, become so much louder? I think we've made parenting harder. Um, I, so? I went to the independent primary school heads uh, meeting in Orange last weekend, and the principals were telling me about 12-year-old girls who are going with their mother to get Brazilians. Now, I have to tell you, I think that's mm. weird, mm. OK? Um, I learnt from uh, one of those principals that an eight-year-old had recently had a birthday party where the parents were serving cordial shots and lemonade chasers. So we're actually teaching children at eight how to drink like adults. So I think there's a wisdom around parenting which is vanishing. And I think we need to go back and listen perhaps to our mothers and fathers and go back to the old ways. Uh, Dr. Phil Which is, is that sort of parents as parents rather than parents as best friends or you've something? You've got to be a mate, not a, 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 a mentor, not a mate. And I think that's so important. Dr. Phil says one thing about kids and he says, never wrestle with a pig in the mud because you both get dirty and the pig loves it. And I think that's <laughs> absolutely... <laughs> I think that's absolutely true. We, we, there's too much wrestling going on. The challenges, it, it's, not, it's surely not just that, because the, the, the challenges of, of drug use and, uh, and alcohol at younger and younger ages, um, everything that, that the internet uh, and, and digital technologies brings, surely that's kind of ramped up the complication factor for parents. Look, I think we tend to complicate this thing. I did a study for Microsoft where we found that 80% of owners of Xbox 360s 
didn't even know that they came with parental controls. Now, that's just dumb. You know, the, there's something beautiful about setting up the controls so that your kid can only play it for two hours on a Friday. I mean, to me, that's poetry in parenting. Mm -hmm. um, I want us to set limits and boundaries. If your kid leaves their crap lying around the house, pick it up and put it in the deep freezer. Uh, it's, it's very simple. There's enjoyment to be had watching kids try to put on frozen shoes. Um, <laughs> if, if a child... If a child leaves... It's true. If, if a child leaves um, the dishes not done, you pick them up and put them in their bed. They won't do it twice. Uh, it's about parents basically setting the limits and boundaries. That's terrific. I love that because, I, you know, I'm kind of done with uh, consequences. That's try, trying to say there'll be a consequence and it, it becomes very difficult to continually uh, develop appropriate and timely consequences. Oh, look, actions things. speak louder than words. Just do it. And uh, they'll say, I, you know, my parenting philosophy after writing now seven parenting books is if you haven't upset your teenager at least three times a week, you're just not trying. Um, <laughs> And secondly, not one gram of your self-esteem should be wound up in what your kids think of your parenting. The only person that matters to um, uh, in my life is um, my wife. And as long as she's happy, trust me, I'm happy. And she, <laughs> and she did put up her hand when you asked who was in a romantic oh, no, relationship. In a romantic that's relationship. That's thank so. God. Yeah. <laughs> who was it with? <laughs> understand a little more about what the small stuff is. Yeah, I mean, it, I, mean I talked about the, um, the... You talked about the computer stuff. Now, look, this isn't complicated. Um, if you don't want your child on MSN for longer than an hour, all you do is download free software called K9 Web Protection and you fix their computer so it only... Uh, basically is able to be attached to MSN for an hour and then it logs them off. So I think what we have to do is be clear that there are some things that are not negotiable and they relate to young people's safety. So um, sex, drugs, alcohol are big issues. Internet safety, huge. Uh, sleep, huge. I don't actually think that we need to have a debate about those sort of things and if you do it right to begin with, then there's no discussion. The trouble is, uh, if we look at alcohol, for example, the research is quite clear. The Australian Drug Foundation says zero tolerance of alcohol under the age of 16. The National, uh, medical, uh, National Health and Medical Research Council, the peak scientific body for Australia, says no kid should have alcohol under the age of 18. Yet, the research says 50% of year of grade 5 kids, 10-year-olds, already had a whole glass of alcohol. I mean, to me, that is just very unintelligent parenting. If, you kid, if your kid drinks alcohol before the age of 14, you double the risk of alcoholism by 21. Now, this isn't new research. Ralph Hengson did this in 2005. Yet we're still saying to parents, you know, watch the alcohol consumption. So I just think it's about parents getting informed. Um, Dr Phil uh, says that, look, Michael, there's going to be some people who'll never darken your door and seek this advice. So you've got to keep writing your books. And I, and I guess that's what keeps me writing the books, to give that practical advice to mums and dads. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can I ask what the latest one's about? Um, the latest one is actually called Crap Parenting and How Not to Be One. And I use a whole lot of the examples like the ones I've just given you um, and explain to parents why it is in fact that they shouldn't be doing that. And I'm writing another book at the same time, especially for step parents, mm -hmm. because there are a lot more step parents now than ever yep. before. And I think step parenting is one of the most tricky areas. And that one's going to be called Busting the Cinderella Syndrome. Mm -hmm. All right, fabulous names for your book, Prince, Princess Bitch Face. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, didn't offend too many little princesses. I did dedicate it to my wife, but not <laughs> for that reason. <laughs> Could I ask you one final question? You mentioned uh, during your presentation that your mentor, Dr. Phil, uh, what was the word he used? Uh, said that we had failed. Um, do you perhaps have uh, a greater sense of optimism? I'm always an optimist, and I think that uh, there is now much more awareness 
that people don't have the skills, the knowledge and the strategies. I think what happened was we moved to these artificial villages called cities to get jobs and in so doing we broke the kinship networks and I think there was an enormous amount of wisdom to be had from the older generation and that's been lost. So now people are searching for it and uh, particularly dads I find are now really interested in what they have to do to connect with their sons mm -hmm. and I think that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please thank Michael Cargrave.